All right. So today we're tugging along in our series through the book of Genesis, and we're currently in the middle of chapter 4. And today we're actually going to go all the way from the middle of chapter 4 to the end of chapter 5. Okay, that's just kind of how the passage breaks down. But starting next Sunday, we're going to take a three-week break from Genesis and do a topical series on faith and work. And then after that, we'll come back in Genesis chapter 6, talking about the life of Noah. Okay? But for today, our focus is Genesis chapter 4 till the end of 5. And it's just one of those passages that we, you won't really understand unless you remember what's happened so far in the story. So give me a few seconds just to recap us all. And if you're new to here, uh, free to know what's going on. So what have we seen so far? Okay, we've seen that in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, what happened? God created the world, right? And God created mankind, Adam and Eve, in his own image, it says. And everything was great. They got married. They were going to have kids. They were going to multiply and fill the earth with a community and a culture that mirrors God. That's, that's called the cultural mandate, as we saw in Genesis chapter 1. That was a plan. But then in Genesis chapter 3 and 4, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They turned this cultural mandate plan into, into chaos, right? They got kicked out of Eden. Their marriage broke. One of their kids, Cain, killed the, their other kid, Abel. And because of that, Cain got kicked out even further away from Eden, and everything's a mess. But what we'll see here today in our passage is that God remains faithful and merciful to Adam and Eve even after they messed everything up. God gave them a second chance of sorts by giving them another child named Seth. And that's, that's where we're at right now in the book, okay? So you have Adam and Eve, and then you have Cain and Seth. And, and what the author is trying to do in this part of the book is tracing both family lines. Cain's family line in Genesis chapter 4, verse 17 till verse 24, and then Seth's family line from Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, continuing here, to the end of chapter 5, okay? And, and the contrast between the two families is kind of the point of the passage. That's why it's so long. I apologize, but we've got to cover both, both family lines, right? So here we have two different families, two different communities, two different cities, you might say, that have two different cultures. One community has a culture that's bent toward the self, and the other community has a culture that's bent toward God. And obviously, the church today is called to be the community that is bent toward God, to be Seth's community, right? And look, before I start, this is really, really important for us all to understand. Why? Because the culture of our church affects the health and the well-being of our community perhaps just as much, one might say, than the sermons themselves. How so? Well, let me share an example from my own life real quick. A long time ago, Tatiana and I, we were once a part of this ministry where everyone in it was severely burnt out, exhausted, tired, resentful to one another, especially toward the leaders. And eventually, the particular team that we we're a part of crumbled, and it broke apart, and it's no more. But see, what's confusing about this is that if you hear the content of their sermons and their Bible studies, for example, it's great. They would preach things like your identity and your value and your worth is in Christ, you know, not in your earthly success or your earthly ministry or your popularity. That's great. But their culture, however, spoke otherwise. Once you got involved in this ministry, it's quickly clear that the people who are rewarded in this ministry, the people who are advanced in the leadership positions in this ministry, weren't people who had the most Christ-like character, who had lives em worth emulating, but popular people who were able to bring more people into the ministry. And we found out later that some people who advanced in leadership weren't even Christians. They were just popular people that had good people skills and could attract more people to come to the ministry. And what this reward system started to do is it shaped a kind of culture in the ministry that preached a truth opposite from the sermons. So Christ was being preached, but everyone was severely burnt out, felt manipulated. The sermon says your value and worth is in Christ. The culture says your value and worth is how pragmatically you can value the ministry. And some even became bitter and left the faith. And the ministry crumbled. Why? Because culture matters. Okay? And the question I think this passage is forcing us to ask is, what cultural canopy do we have here in this church? 
what nonverbal, subtle messages exist here in this church teaching us, discipling us, shaping us? And is this cultural canopy that we have indexed toward God, like Seth's community, or is it indexed and geared toward us, like Cain's community? Okay? And by the way, I'm not going to read Seth's family line in chapter 5. It's just way too long. So I'll just point out the ones that are key to the narrative later in points 1 and 2. Okay? So here's the Word of God from Genesis chapter 4, verse 17 to chapter 5, verse 32, but I'll only read right now up to the end of chapter 4. This is God's Word. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, Irad, and Irad fathered Mehujel, and Mehujel fathered Methushel, Methushel fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada, Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God had appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And then you have a list of Seth's descendants in chapter 5. Thus says the Lord. All right, three things I want to point out from the passage. The culture of Cain's city, the culture of God's city, and what makes the difference. The culture of Cain's city, God's city, what makes the difference. First point, the culture of Cain's city. All right, before I get into it, I do, though, have to address this one question, because I know some peculiar mind out there is asking themselves, who in the world is Cain's wife? Right? Because so far, what we have is Adam and Eve, and then Cain and Abel, and then Cain killed Abel. So now we got Adam and Eve and Cain. So where did this wife come from? Okay. The first thing we got to know about genealogies in the Bible is that they never, ever mention every single person in the family. They only mention the ones that are important to the message that the author is trying to proclaim. So if you take a look at our passage in, our, in your printouts, go to chapter 5, verse 4. What you'll see there is that Adam and Eve actually had more children than just Abel and Cain. They're just not mentioned in the details. It says there, the days of Adam after he had fathered Seth was 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters besides Cain and Abel. It just weren't mentioned in detail. So, yes, most likely case here is that Cain married his sibling. Okay, first of all, weird. Second of all, I thought that was prohibited in the Bible. I thought you weren't allowed to do that. Yes, it was, but it was prohibited only starting Leviticus 18 onwards. It wasn't yet prohibited in Genesis. In fact, if you think about it, the command for Adam and Eve to multiply and fill the earth, as God commanded in Genesis 1, wouldn't only permit but require marriage within the family unit. I mean, how else is that going to work out? Okay? But yes, you're right. This practice was then disallowed in Leviticus 18. And I'm going to stop there. If you have any questions, email Sam. <laughs> the point here is, okay, that even though Cain sinned and got kicked out far from Eden, separated from God, he still kind of instinctively carried out the cultural mandate. Isn't that interesting? So, remember, get married, multiply, fill the earth with a community and a culture, right? That's the original plan. Cain, what did he do? He got married. He had kids. He even built a whole city, it says, a city filled with culture, it had tools, art, music, poetry. Where do we see that? Well, let's take a look at some of Cain's descendants here. Go to verses 20 and 22 in your pronouns. First of all, who do you see there? You see Jabal. Verse 20 says, Jabal was the father of those who live in tents, and have livestock. Now, that's cultural progress. How do we see that? Well, if you remember in the beginning of Genesis chapter 4, you see Abel, he was also a shepherd, but what did he shepherd? Just sheep. That's it. 
But now, Jabal here heard whole livestock. That means somehow he scaled up and figured out a way to have a bigger and better system for herding. Cultural progress, great. And he also made tents, by the way. He found a way to shape wood, sculpture stone, design fabric in order to create shelter. Great. This is God's culture mandate taking place. Verse 21, you see Jubal, the father of all who played the lyre, which is like a small guitar, and a pipe. He created musical instruments. This is also culture progress, because if you see in Genesis chapter 2, remember when Adam first saw Eve, what did he do? All he did was utter poetry. As beautiful as it was, there wasn't any music to go with it. And now, there's music, cultural progress. We also see technology here in the city. Go to Tubal Cain in verse 22. He was the forger of all instruments, bronze, really more accurately, maybe copper here, and iron. So he figured out that if you reach a particular temperature, right, you could mold copper iron into functional tools, which historical records would affirm that copper is the first metal to be molded. Cultural advancement, great. What a buzzing city, right, filled with technology, music, art, cool tents, tools, herding systems for mass food production. Genesis 1's cultural mandate still moving forward. Everything's going well until you see one last cultural good produced here in verse 23 that just hits the brakes on all of our hope by a guy named Lamech, who, by the way, is Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal's dad, who is also the seventh descendant of Cain. Now, in Genesis, the number seven is significant because it represents finality and completion. So the seventh descendant of Cain here is kind of like the archetype of the whole family line, okay? So... Lamech is, is the archetype person for the city of Cain. Okay, good. What cultural good did he produce? Well, you look at verse 23, he produced a poem. Is not poetry cultural good? It is. It's a nice one. All right, what does it say? Well, let's take a look at it. Ada, Zilla, hear my voice. You, my wives, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And the reader at this point is meant to ask themselves, did this guy just write a poem bragging about murder? So a young man struck him, and his revenge was seventy-sevenfold, so he killed him. And then, and then he wrote a poem about it. He goes, Ada, Zilla, my wives, come. Listen to this really cool poem I wrote. I killed someone. Oh, and by the way, he was younger than me. So I'm older, but I'm stronger. Fifty's the new 20. I still got it. Look at me. Look at my strength. <laughs> and it's like, what in the world just happened? This poem is meant to redefine everything that we see in the city of Cain. Because now all these cultural goods that we saw made by Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal, uh, Lamech's kids, is overshadowed by the song of their father, the seventh archetypal descendant of Cain. And we start to think maybe these cultural goods weren't made for God. Maybe they were made for the pride and self-indulgence of man. And then you start seeing signs everywhere. For example, Lamech, he got married, right? Great. That's part of the cultural mandate get married. But how many wives did he have? Two wives, Ada and Zillah. That's not what God commanded in Genesis 1. God said a husband and a wife, not a husband and two wives. See, the culture of the city of Cain, as beautiful as it was, as glorious as it may be, is severely marred. And suddenly, we start to think, what were these iron tools made for? I assume they're made for good, but after reading this poem, I don't know anymore. What were the songs made from this lyre glorifying? What happened in all those tents? What was this technology used for? See, the Bible, in the Bible, culture is not bad. Music's not bad. Tents aren't bad. Technology, movies, music, uh, social media, 
it's not bad. Advancing these things is a part of the cultural mandate. The question is, are these cultural goods that we produce indexed toward God or toward us? And usually it's a mix, right? Right? Great songs with amazing beats have terrible plans for women. Amazing movies with pristine acting glorify the wrong things. See, music's bad, movies bad. No, they're not. They're great. But music and movies indexed toward our carnal desires is bad. And God calls us Christians not to escape or demonize culture, but to create a kind of culture that's indexed toward God, which leads us to our second point, the culture of the city of God. Okay, let's take a look at the contrast here between Cain's family and Seth's family. And the contrast begins with Eve, their mother. Rewind in your minds what Eve said in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, when Cain was first born. Remember what she said? When Cain was born, she said, I got the man. I did it. You know, I got... And it's, th there is this vibe of arrogance there in Eve's voice, and it didn't quite work out. Cain also grew in pride, killed Abel. But now look at what she said when Seth was birthed in verse 25. God has appointed for me an offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. There's a much more sober air surrounding Seth's birth compared to Cain's. Not I got him, but God gave him to me. So from the get-go, pride marked births Cain, but humility marked Seth. But then also, fast forward, look at the seventh descendant of Seth's line here in chapter 5, verse 21 in your pronouns. Remember how the seventh descendant is kind of like the archetype form of the family? For Canaan was Lamech, for Seth is this guy named Enoch in chapter 5, verse 21. And Enoch was described there to have walked with God. That's amazing. No one else in this family on is described to walk with God. And then at the end it says that he's righteous. He didn't even die. Look at verse 24. God took him. It's like, what? <laughs> the only other time this happened in the Old Testament was with Elijah, who was also so righteous and walked so cl closely with God. He didn't taste physical death, but God kind of took him. That's crazy. I know. But the point here is that the seventh archetypal, archetypal descendant of Seth, Enoch, is supposed to be contrasted with the seventh archetypal descendant of Cain, Lamech. One is righteous and intimate with God. The other is vengeful and self-indulgent. And God's people here is called to have Enoch's heart, not Lamech's. That's the point. Because if we have Enoch's heart, that's the kind of heart we need to have in order to create a kind of culture that's oriented toward God. It starts with our hearts. And this is what I believe chapter 4, verse 26 hints to. Look at chapter 4, verse 26. It says there that during those days, the descendants of Seth started to call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. Now, that phrase in the Old Testament, whenever someone calls upon the name of the Lord, that's more than just like a personal individual prayer. That's to describe a proper worship service of sorts. So Seth's descendants here started to have worship services of sorts, pointing to what? Future temple practices that happened in the Old Testament when Israel, God's people, would come together and do worship services. Now, stick with me here for a second. If you think about the Old Testament temple worships that happen in the Old Testament, what's all involved in these temple worships? Did it not also involve music and poetry? Remember Psalm 33? What does it say? Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to Him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. It involved music, poetry, lyres. <laughs> did it not also involve a tent? Where did God's presence reside in the Old Testament during these worship services? In a tent, skillfully made, skillfully woven. And guess what material was used a lot in making this temple tent of worship? Copper for the basin of washing in Exodus chapter 30 is specifically made from molded copper. Look, 
Here's a point. Here's a call for us Christians. Don't run away or demonize culture. You can't. Instead, participate in making a culture that's indexed toward God instead of pride and self-indulgence. And, and we got to take this seriously. It's not just some side note principle that we can afford to not do. This, is, this deeply affects you and the people that you love. How? For example, if in my family I do devotionals every single night, I don't. I try. If I do that, right, and in the morning I do these, these devotionals with my children, and every day I tell them, look, kids, everyone's a sinner. Everyone needs Jesus. Everyone needs forgiveness in Christ. Great. However, throughout my life, I never, ever, ever, ever say the words, I'm sorry, to anyone in my family. Dad's never wrong. What kind of culture do you think that creates? See, my words say everyone's a sinner and they need Jesus, but my actions create a culture that says, except for dad. Which one do you think speaks louder? Or you're managing a team in your workspace, and you say to your team this, our culture, okay, is excellence, respect, and dignity, and you paint those three words on the wall, in every wall. But then you let the most productive employee in the company get away with treating others disrespectfully and unkindly all the time just because they make more money for the company than others. What will speak louder to the team? Those three letters that you painted on the wall or the cultural vibe that you've painted throughout your whole office <laughs> with your behavior? Or maybe at church the pastor preaches, or in your community groups, the leader teaches, everyone's equal in Christ. But then very obviously, this church favors people who have more earthly possessions and always give them priority over those who don't. What speaks louder? What will disciple your members more? This matters. Everything we say, everything we do, contribute to the culture, our method, of choosing friends, which child we reward more than the other, <laughs> the amount of time we hold on to grudges for, how we treat our helpers at home, how you go on dates, what we say, what we don't say, name it. Everything we do, like it or not, all these small decisions compound to a larger cultural canopy that surrounds and infects everyone in it. And our task, Christian, is not to escape that cultural canopy. That's impossible. Our task is to participate in indexing that cultural canopy toward God. That's the call here. How? Let's go to our last point. What makes the difference between the city of Cain and the city of God? Now, let's just first admit that this is a scary thing to admit, right, and to realize because, you know, if we really scrutinize our culture here, Covenant City Church, if we really, really scrutinize the invisible canopy around us that's preaching sermons after the sermon's done, I think what we find is that there's a lot of cracks. It's flawed. And how about the invisible canopy surrounding your family or your marriage? You, you'll find it flawed as well. And it's like, okay, now I'm worried. <laughs> well, good. The first step to fixing something usually is being worried about it, realizing that it's not perfect. And we got to do that. If we're on a CCC, do we not have Cain-like vibes going around here? I mean, hopefully it's not too bad. But let's get over ourselves, you know? It's here. It's here. It's in every church. It's in every family. It's in every friend group. It's in every community. But don't be discouraged. Because even if we had the most perfect culture ever, that won't save us either. Because our hope isn't found in having the perfect culture. And this is made clear in our passage. Look at Seth's family line in chapter 5. I mean, if anyone, these were the guys who were supposed to be the example of good culture, yet still, in that family, the power of death reigned. 
That's the point of this family. This guy lived for this amount of years and he died. This guy lived for this amount of years and he died. He lived, died, died, died. Everyone here still died. Death still reigned, even in a community that had a culture indexed toward God. And it's like, okay, so what hope is there for us? You know, if, if Seth's family failed, how can this family succeed? Well, here's our hope. Keep going down Seth's family line. Read all the way down. Who's the last guy you see there? Noah. And this guy, when mentioned in verse 29, he's described a little bit differently. Everyone else died, 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 died. But Noah, it says, will bring us relief. Okay? Out of the ground, the Lord has cursed. This one shall bring us relief. And that's exactly what he did, right? You guys know the story. He built an ark, which arguably is a cultural artifact. And this ark relieved a remnant from the flood of God's wrath and brought relief instead of death. Great. He's the answer. Well, then you read on, and then you found out that he's not. Because what happened after the flood? He still sinned, and he died. And it's like, okay, man, no one's able to break Lamech's 77-fold culture of vengeance. Like, it's infiltrated everyone. Seth's community, Noah, our hope, every person, every community. And when the reader has their hope down and everything seems like it's a loss, what we're meant to be reminded of here is someone who came to earth and he said something very peculiar. He said, forgive not only seven times, but how many? Seventy times seven. And, and the guy who said this didn't only preach it, he lived it. Because eventually he was crucified on a cross. But instead of trying to get back to the people who struck him like Lamech did, what did he do? He prayed for them. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Lamech preached vengeance 77-fold, then killed a man. Jesus said, forgive 70 times 7, then died for our sins and became our relief. Noah is not the answer. Noah is meant to point us to Jesus. A theologian once said, just as Noah obeyed God, by climbing onto a boat to save a few. Jesus obeyed the Father by climbing onto a cross to save many. Our hope is not found in how good our culture is, friends. Our hope is found in the true and better Noah, who was crucified on a cultural artifact called a cross so that you and I can be forgiven 70 times 7. That's the point of the Bible. And if that gospel infects your heart, look, cultural change will follow. Here's the thing about culture. You can't tame it. You can't micromanage it. It's not up to one person. It has a life of its own. Okay, sure. You know, let's have good SOPs in place to promote Christ-like culture in this church. Great. Let's redefine CCC's bottom line to measure not only quantitative growth, but also qualitative growth. That's great. Let's do that. Let's make sure that the leaders in training program, which some of you are currently in right now, to be shaped in such a way that it points the right leaders into the right place. Awesome. All these things are, are, are great, and we need to continue to work on them. But look, at the end of the day, that's only going to touch the surface of culture making. At the end of the day, it depends on your heart, Christian. It depends on whether or not the germinating seed upon which your behavior grows out of is Lamech-like or Christ-like. There's no shortcut to it. No SOP, no KPI, no training program in this church can replace authentic, 
gospel-humbled hearts, and I can't make those. I can't make those. I can barely make it in my own heart. All I can do, all we can do, is direct our attention upon Jesus, who's relieved us from God's wrath, not with a wooden ark, but on a wooden cross. And then hope and pray and beg that the Spirit lights a gospel flame in our hearts hot enough to forge a culture fit to represent the city of God. That's all we can do. Let's do that. Let's turn our eyes upon Jesus and beg that the Spirit which shaped such a canopy here, we depend on it. May we be molded more like Seth's community rather than the citizens of Cain as we continue to represent him in this city that we love. Would you turn your eyes to Christ with me and pray for this? I hope you will. Let's do that right now. Father, we have failed miserably. We can fake it every Sunday. We can put the right songs with the right lyrics. We can preach the right sermons with the right words. We can have the right liturgy, have the right questions for a community group, and all these things are great and help us to continue to do so faithfully to you and your word. But at the end of the day, there are Cain-like vibes hanging around, even here. We are fully dependent upon you to shape the canopy of this church in such a way that the gospel we preach and desperately turn to will truly germinate our hearts and birth from it tree and fruit beautiful for you. Because the culture of this church will shape and disciple the people in this church, perhaps at times even louder than the sermons themselves. May you have this mercy on your people and may you build us into the city of you, God. And remember the one who's transferred us from being citizens in Cain to having membership, to having citizenship in the city of God. Christ, the true and better Noah. In him and in him alone, we place all of our hope. And in his name alone, we also pray. Amen.